Hello, and thank you for joining us for day six of Archetizer Future Fest. To those of you who have attended our previous talks, welcome back. And if this is your first event, thank you for joining us. Future Fest comprises an epic series of 15 live talks over three weeks with A plus award winners from all over the world, forming a vibrant celebration of architectural innovation. It's also our way of warming up for the 11th annual A plus awards, which for the first time I can reveal an official launch date for, um, will be opening for entries on October 17th this year. So mark your calendars accordingly. And also you can stay tuned for more details on that a little bit later. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Paul Keskes. I'm the editor and chief architizer. And today I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to chat with Michael Green of Michael Green Architecture as he shares his vision for buildings for a changing world. Now, while we wait for the room to fill up a little bit, I want to encourage all of you to say hi in the chat box on the right side of your screen and let us know where you're from. It's always amazing to see such a global audience. Now, here are a few quick pointers about our live platform. If you're having any technical difficulties with the stream, you can click on the help icon in the bottom left corner of your screen and you'll see a few options for improving your picture, the sound and so on. It's worth not noting that there will also be a recorded version of the talk so you can catch up on anything you missed or share this with your colleagues after the event. For questions, you can type anything you like in the chat, but if you have a specific question you'd like to ask Michael, we recommend you use the questions tab. Just click on the questions icon on the bottom right of your screen and then type your question there. If you see a question from someone else that you'd be interested in hearing, you can upvote it and we'll, we'll aim to ask Michael the most popular questions a little later on. And finally, feel free to use the react button whenever you see something you like. Now, for those of you who registered early for Future Fest and have been receiving invites to each talk we've hosted so far, I've got some important instructions. Due to some technical challenges we've been facing with our platform, we are now asking that you register for each talk directly in order to receive your access links. So to do this, you can go to architizer.com and click on the very top article on the website. Then you can scroll down to learn more about each talk and click on the accompanying links to sign up for each one. You can also share that article with your friends and colleagues who might like to attend and they can sign up for any that they like over the next couple of weeks. Now I'm thrilled to introduce Michael Green. Michael is an award-winning architect, speaker, and author known for using design it, known for using design to create meaningful, sustainable built environments that benefit both people and planet. A leader in wood construction and innovation, Michael is a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada and the recipient of an honorary doctorate degree from the University of Northern British Columbia, lecturing internationally on the subject of mass timber and new building technology, including his TED talk, Why We Should Build Wooden Skyscrapers. He serves as a government policy advisor on mass timber design and is the co-author of the first and second editions of The Case for Tall Wood Buildings and Tall Wood Buildings, Design, Construction and Performance. And so, Michael, I will hand the mic over to you and ask what you've got in store for us today. Great. Thank you. Um, so thanks, everyone, for coming and listening to this talk. I hope it... Uh, is interesting for everyone. It's a different talk than I've given in the past. And so um, with that, let's launch in. Um, I'm going to start by just sort of um, introducing you to our team. This is almost all our team. Of course, there's a few photos of people that are still missing. Um, but we are located out here in Vancouver, Canada, on the west coast of Canada. And we're a small team, about 35, 40 of us now. Um, and I'm going to highlight this person in the middle, who is Natalie, and that is my partner at MGA. And Natalie and I um, have been working together for a very long time around a focus on timber buildings. We're an 11 year old firm now. Um, we exclusively build in timber and other organic materials. And we're um, um, highly vo motivated to share what we do um, with everybody um, as a way to kind of 
you know, teach with the lessons learned, both the good and the bad of what we learned through our process of trying to innovate in wood and build um, as as carbon neutral and energy neutral buildings as we possibly can. And 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 to our good fortune, we've been able to do a lot of that. Um, so so we also want to thank Architizer and the A Plus Awards for for choosing us as, as with the 2022 North American Firm Award. It's a a huge honor. The the award program, I think, is is an absolutely brilliant opportunity to celebrate this incredible community we have around the globe doing incredibly meaningful work and, and the huge talent that exists all over the world. It is um, it is remarkable, um, I think, how this profession um, dedicates so much love and what we do and 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 the results and, and the celebration through this awards program is incredible. And I'm really grateful. For us to be awarded, I'm grateful um, to be included with all these amazing um, other teams that have, have um, also won, a, won awards. Um, we were um, we were we had the good fortune of winning this this North American Firm Award in 2021 as well. And I, I kind of started to wonder, and I've been meaning to ask Paul if the way the award thing works is like that you know, the ball machine at the lottery and, and the balls were bouncing around and somehow our ball got stuck two years in a row in the North American Firm Awards. So I'm pretty sure that's why we won this year. Highly recommend that's that a good, submit for next year. That's exactly, that's exactly <laughs> how it works. It's totally right. And it's how it works, right? I thought that might be Just it. kidding. Uh, yeah, we're, so, so again, thank you. It's, it's a huge, huge honor. Um, today, I'm going to talk about buildings for a changing world. And in, in a way, actually, you know, when I came up with the idea of how to, what, what I wanted to talk about today, um, it sort of morphed a little bit through through the process of building the talk. And I, I ended up thinking a lot about sort of the big, broad issues facing practices around the world, um, what it takes as a firm to kind of move through this very complicated world of, of doing the work we all do, um, and, and perhaps what we should do um, to engage a little more in the industry and to engage a little more on the global issues in front of us. Um, ironically, this is the, the main slide of the work I'm going to show of our, of our work. I'm not going to speak about specific projects today. I'm going to talk more broadly. Um, as I mentioned, our work is all timber. It's pretty diverse in scale and diverse in locations around the world. Um, those two decisions were not just um, uh, good fortune, but also an actual business strategy as the economy climbs and, and does its sort of cycle in different parts of the world and uh, building types change um, what's what's what we're building, either institutional or commercial or residential. Um, we want it to be diverse and we've been able to be diverse and that strategy has served us well of, of staying diverse. We're a generalist firm, not a not a specific um, um, expert expert oriented firm around building typology although as as i've noted we're very focused on timber expertise so um, but we'll apply that to anything from institutional projects city halls museums all the way through to residential and, and commercial pro projects and an occasional single family house but pretty rarely um, that we do that kind of work so this that's a little bit sort of about us and as I as I mentioned, you know the award that we won this year is is a huge honor, but it's really about the team, um, and so I'm going to speak about them a little bit throughout this um, about the different perspectives we all have um, and and how that's built the firm and and how much um, pride that uh, Natalie and I have in our team, but also um, how honored we are that they choose to collaborate with us and and all the collaborators that work with us. Um, how honored we are that we have them as well. So today's talk is going to try to tackle these issues and these are a little bit insane in the magnitude of them. So how does architecture play a role in our current world of shifting economics, global conflict, changing climate, environment, and distressing social division? That's a big one. As design professionals, we must ask ourselves if we're addressing these social, political, environmental, and economic realities in our world, or are we simply trying to hold our heads above water? And I think Holding our heads above water is a very reasonable reality for many of us, and it's an important thing for us to, to talk about. So I'm going to talk about it. With so many issues to confront, how do we become leaders again? Maintain our industry's voice and create change without becoming overwhelmed. How do we champion a greener, friendlier, more connected, more dynamic, and more vibrant future? So these are the aspirations of this talk. These are big aspirations. And, and I think I really welcome this to become a conversation really with you all 
um, bringing your own perspectives at the second half of the talk um, around these kinds of issues. But to kind of dive in and get us going, I thought um, I sort of started thinking about what we all as practitioners of architecture or design of any type, landscape, interiors, and so forth, that we all have a, uh, on our minds global issues to tackle, global and community-based issues. I think they go hand in hand. Practice issues, running of our firms, project issues, the day-to-day -day reality of, of each project and what needs to happen. And then our professional issues, which are really how do we come together as, as a profession and, and be able to speak to the kinds of things that we can influence together. So I sat down and I built this list. And this is a very incomplete list quite intentionally. So what you'll see here is under global issues, um, there's a huge litany of things. Um, and as I say, global could also be community issues. Um, and uh, this list is enormous um, that we each in our in our day to day practices have to tackle in some way or another. And now we can't tackle them all. Um, certainly this list on the left, those are the kinds of global issues that, and again, this is a, a sort of abbreviated list of global issues that, that can touch the work that, that many of us are doing in different ways, or should touch the work that we're doing in different ways. Um, these are the practice issues, everything from, you know, finding work and managing our staff and being competitive and managing risk or, you know, financial stability or succession planning. These are all issues that we have to think about in our practices to be able to, to you know, manage the day-to-day -day reality of being a business in design. And on projects, there's everything from zoning and building code issues and building teams and collaborating with engineers and all of the realities of technology and so forth that we have to think about. And finally, as professions, we have to think about as within the profession, what, who are we together, right? What do our professional associations represent? How do we personally and, and as firms engage in our professional associations? Um, how do we bring issues of uh, voice and activism and education? Um, how do we speak to these issues and not just with each other, but with the community and with the, with the public at large? How much are we engaging those kinds of things. And so with this huge page of issues that you see here of things that we all have to think about, um, some you know more than others in our day-to-day -day job, what's kind of funny is that that word design shows up just in the middle there. You know, what we're seen as, as doing in our profession is designing buildings. And the reality is, if anybody that's practicing, we know that there are a million other issues that we have to think about simply a to find the time to design and b to make design important in our practices but it's not the only thing that we do and yet you know for many of us it's what we love the most and we have to find more time to do and so how do we do that in the context of all of these other issues that need to be thought about respected now this is without a doubt a hard profession and and yet i like to think that it's also a beautiful one and not um, not just because I love it, but it is a unique profession in the fact that unlike many other professions in the world, architects and designers think about the big picture. We think about those problems, those global problems, those community problems, and we care about them. There are very few other professions um, that exist that so deeply invest in the complexity of our world as ours. And that is both a challenge and an opportunity for all of us. Um, and it's, it's something that's very deeply important to me. But if it's hard, then why do we do it, right? And if we ask ourselves why we do it, and I hope you all ask yourselves weekly, why are we doing this? Because I know it's hard. It's obviously for money, status, and fame. Um, but I think if you're in this practice for very long, you know that it's not about money, and it's certainly not about status and not about fame. Um, so what is it? And I think many of us practice um, for the word of love. And I, I don't think we say it enough. I don't think we use that word very much, but I do think that the love that we give through our day-to-day -day effort and work um, to make better communities, to make better buildings, to make the lives of others better through what we do and choose to do um, is a type of love. It's an act of love. And 
we should express it that way. It's not about making things beautiful. It's not about making things, uh, although that's clearly important. It's not about diving deep into cultural issues, which of course that's important. It, it is all summarized for me as an act of love. And I, um, I think it's a way we should talk about the work more. I also think for many of us, and each of you will be different, it's also about the happiness we find in, in the work we do, the fulfillment we find, the making a difference, the sense that we are making a difference in our communities, and of course, making a living. And there may be a much larger list for each of you of why you practice design or are interested uh, in, in this field, but these things matter. Um, to motivate us to continue to do well at what we do, we have to be motivated and we have to have a sense of happiness. And so that word happiness is a really interesting word. Um, to, to do good work, it requires that we come from a good place in our minds and that we, we are practicing with a sense of, of fulfillment and, and happiness. And that word the happiness for me really took on a stronger presence in the way I started thinking about our practice and the, and the practice of, of design and architecture, um, both because I think it's important to design for human happiness all the time in, in every building we do, is to create a sense of joy and happiness. But also because I had this good fortune this year of, of sitting in the audience and listening to Arthur Black, who is an incredible economist and, and faculty member at the Harvard Business School, and he teaches a class on human happiness. And it's, it's, I, I believe it's the number one most attended class at Harvard Business School. And it's shifting the way businesses think about themselves and their role in the world and how their staff feel fulfilled, fulfilled and how their leadership feel, feel, feel fulfilled, um, and how that can drive better work through all businesses, but I certainly think our business. And so Arthur Black spoke about this idea that happiness is built on these three macro ingredients. And, I, and I, by the way, if you can listen to him talk, I highly recommend it. It's a very inspiring way of seeing the world. Um, by the way, I don't know why the slides zoom across the page. That's kind of, wasn't my intention, but it's kind of fun. Um, so he talks about these being the three macro ingredients, enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose. Now in design, I think for many of us, we enjoy what we do. We, I love sitting down and drawing. I think many people do. I love the, the collaborating with others. I think many people do. Our team love that kind of spirit of, of shared adventure in the, in the process of building and designing things. So enjoyment is of, of course a core ingredient happiness of any firm or any person, I think. Um, satisfaction, we get, I think, uniquely um, through design, um, both the satisfaction of knowing we're doing something good for our community and also the satisfaction of being able to see a built form, something that we've created through, you know, from paper to reality. And that satisfaction, I think, for many of us is, is enormous. We, we, we see the results of the hard work, ultimately, if we're, if we're fortunate for projects to, to be seen through to fruition. But the, the last word there, purpose, is the one that I'm going to focus on um, because it's the piece that for many of us, we, we, we weave in and out of in our lives. We have a sense of, of purpose at different times of our lives, but sometimes it helps to be reminded what your sense of purpose is. And it's a really important part of the process of, of feeling satisfied, but I also believe purpose is where architecture businesses thrive. I, I think purpose is the differentiator between just making buildings and building buildings with meaning and impact. And that's our aspiration as architects and, and designers is to have and bring meaning to our community, to our planet, to others. So when we look at that huge list of complex issues, in a way, where does purpose reside? It resides at these two extremes, the two areas not in the middle, not, it's not in running our practice necessarily, although certainly you can have purpose in running a, a successful practice. Um, it's not in the projects, although certainly that, that's a place you can have purpose. But really it's in how our work solves or, or addresses one of these global issues, you know, climate change, others, or community-based issues, homelessness or, or affordability issues. Um, how our purpose is locking into some of these bigger, broader problems in the world outside of our day-to-day -day practices. 
and also in turn, how does it relate back to, to advancing the aspiration of our professions as a, as a whole? How does it make us together somehow more relevant to society as an industry? So I often think about it like this, and it's sort of the global issues are this enormous weight. Our actions are really the running of our practices and the, pro and the way we produce our projects, which is a, an enormous amount of work going into those actions. But those global issues are kind of the weight of the world on us, and they actually inform a lot for a lot of us what we do. As I mentioned in the beginning, climate change is a huge, huge issue for our firm. It has been since its origin. We, I believe it should be the largest firm for every, uh, every business on the planet, the, la the largest issue. Um, but for us, it's driven that that's been the weight of the world of making sure that every time we act through our practice or through our projects, that that issue of that bigger, broader global issue is, is somehow for for foremost in the way we think and then also how it, it it informs us as who we are as a profession so our actions the projects we create are a reflection to the world of who we are as an industry and our ability to think about the global issues act through our projects and through the way we run our firms gives us a chance to start to shape and change the way our voice in the world acts as as, as professionals as a collective and why that's so important, I think, is that our voice as professionals has, has been in many ways quieted over the years. It is um, both a blessing and a curse that the way buildings are represented um, has, you know, through the internet has given us a chance to showcase the beauty of the work we do, but not always tell the story of the meaning of the work we do. The meaning of the work we do is taking these bigger, broader, community-based issues and global issues and, and filtering them through the projects and our actions in the projects to reshape the way our professions of relevance works in the world. We sit on, in North America, 40, 49, 48% of, of greenhouse gas emissions is coming from the building industry. Globally, almost 40% is coming from the building industry. And yet our voice as an industry is still very small. And most people think what we do is make beautiful things, make beautiful buildings. They don't realize that what we're actually doing is trying to tackle these bigger, more complicated problems. So purpose is our why. It's the reason we do what we do. And there's a, another talk I wanna sort of point you to if you haven't seen it already. It's a very, very well-known talk by Simon Sinek that was done for, for TED Talks uh, over 10 years ago now. And what Simon talks about is the fact that, that most businesses in the world talk about what they make. That's the outer ring of his circle in his talk. And I, again, I recommend you, you go see his talk. They talk about what they make. So, so for us as architects and designers, what we make is a building. Sometimes some companies talk about how they make it. So in, in, a, in the example of our firm, how is we build it in timber? That's how. But very few firms talk about why, the why, that's that inner circle. Very few firms talk about why they do what they do. And so for us, it's this deep desire to actually make profound change around issues of climate through the building, the built environment. And what Simon talks about is people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And so this idea that you don't just talk about, oh, we make schools or we make hospitals. And we don't just talk about, oh, we, we do it by, you know, the how, which is, you know, we build in steel or we build in wood or we build um, through collaboration or, or whatever we call our how. It's really why do you do it? So, you know, might be that you do it for a passion towards one of these global issues. And that's what I think is important, is being able to find in every firm the story of why. In all of us, we have a story of why. We've had it very often since we were kids. Um, why do we choose this profession? What are we trying to make a difference in? And, and being able to express it back to the public so that we're no longer just talked about as a profession making pretty things making beauty in the world, but a profession that's making deep meaning in the world. So for our firm, I'd say each individual in our in our practice is different. 
has a different sense of personal story of why, why they do architecture, why they're here, why they want to be part of our collaboration. But we also have a pra our, our practice why um, that motivates us. And I could write it in many different ways. Last night I wrote it, innovate how we build to reduce our carbon footprint, then share ideas for free and accelerate the message. I enjoy speaking about what we do because I want to share what we do. When we wrote the early book on books on tall wood buildings, we did what was called Creative Commons licenses on the work we were doing to guarantee that it could be shared with others and never profited from, because we want to make the world better and make sh and, and offer up as much education and as much support for these ideas to actually happen so that we actually can reduce our carbon footprint. Rather than think about it as a competitive advantage, we want to do it in a way that we share. So for me, I started to reflect about this idea that we each have a story. Each of you listening today has a story of why. Why, do, why, what motivates you, what brings you joy, what brings you happiness, and what is your purpose, your story of why. And so I thought just sort of uh, it'd be fun to share the story of why and how in a way that for me, our practice became so dedicated to this idea of, of nature and the planet. Um, so that's me as a kid, and I put that in because I think it's a super cute photo of me. It's one of the very few that I've ever found that I like. Um, but that's me when I'm 10. And when I was 10, um, I, uh, I fell in love with rock climbing. Um, I fell in love with mountaineering. And I um, had the good fortune at the time, this was, uh, uh, I'll admit, this is in the late 1970s. And um, I started reading about this guy here, and some of you will recognize him, others will not, but this is a man named Yvon Chouinard. And Yvon Chouinard um, in the 70s was, I had the good fortune of reading a little bit about him. And, and the reason is the early rock climbing gear that I had, had his name on it. He was selling these carabiners and, and tools that I was using to go rock climbing. And so I started investigating about him and I learned a really important story. And this is before I became an architect, but it's the story that I've actually carried through my career. Um, he was, um, he started his life as a blacksmith and as a climbing bum in Yosemite. And so that's him on the left. And what he was making as a blacksmith were those things that are assembled in the, in the circle there on the ground next to him on the right. And those are called pitons. And the piton is like a, a metal wedge that, they, they used to, and very rarely still do, hammer into a crack in the rock. And they clip, you clip into it to, be, to run the rope to be, to be safe. And that's how all climbing was being done in the, in the 50s and 60s when Yvonne Chouinard was, was first working. And so he was selling these pitons. He was the number one seller of pitons and it supported his ability to climb. And, and um, this was right around, this is, you know, just before I started climbing. And there was a point he reached where he sort of started looking at the natural world and the sort of adventure he was having of being a rock climber and realized that as you hammer a piton into a crack, it of course damages the rock. And every time you do it, that crack gets a little bigger and you have to make a slightly bigger pin in order for it to fit or a slightly bigger piton in order for it to fit. And over and over again, that crack gets wider and more damaged. And he started to reflect on the fact that here he is trying to and go out and enjoy the, the wilderness and enjoy the sport that was all about being in the mountains. And what was he doing? He was damaging the rock permanently, scarring the rock by pounding these pitons in. So he and a few others came up with what were called stoppers or hexcentrics. So those things, those sort of interesting blocks of aluminum around his neck there on the left, or that, that little, what's called a stopper on the right that's wedged in the crack, those were an idea he came up with to create what's called clean climbing, where he could insert those in. If they fell, they wedged and protected them, but you could lift them out and they wouldn't scar the rock. And so that idea for him was how to transform this industry he was in from very damaging to very clean. Now, I was 10, 11, 12, 13, reading these books and really learning about his mountaineering exploits and also realizing that he had this business that he was willing to transform around this issue of not hurting the environment. So if you know who Yvonne Chouinard is, you also know that he 
went on to create the company Patagonia. From that, he um, took many of the philosophies he had around this, this goal to not damage the environment. And he published in the 1980s, um, while well, a catalog for Patagonia that basically explained all of the terrible things Patagonia does for the environment. And it had never been done before. It was considered an incredibly stupid thing to do to admit what you do wrong as a company. Um, but what he said at the end of this sort of deep dive of investigating the impact of all the clothing he was making, the impact on water, the impact on what, what was being used using fossil fuels to make it, what he said at the end of it is that we are doing all these bad things for the environment and making the gear that we make to allow you to go outside and enjoy nature. But I promise you that each year we are going to get better and I'm going to publish and be transparent of all the bad things we do in order to show you that we are trying to get better. Now, as a young person, and this again is sort of right, that happened right when I was in architecture school, I cared more about that story, I think, than anything else I was learning in school. I cared more about the idea that, you know, what we do as designers and builders is build buildings that have an impact. I cared more about the idea of, of noticing and caring about how that impact wasn't okay and that it needed to change and that we needed to find a clean way just like clean climbing was created for rock climbing um we needed to find a, a new way to build buildings and we still don't have it but we need to be transparent in the fact that what we do isn't actually good for the environment and we have a long way to go before it is and so that idea of transparency um, that Patagonia sort of broke the mold around in the business world, um, you know, really is a model for us in our practice of, uh, practice and became a sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of the, the hallmark of what, or the aspiration of who we wanted to be and admitting the things that we don't do well and aspiring to do things better. So if we're here to enjoy the natural world. Why are we destroying it? It's the question that Patagonia asked. And, and I think for us, we ask that question of how do we reconcile the brutality of human demands on the planet and how do we call our work sustainable if it really is not? So our firm has had this good, this lovely sort of um, very kind sort of nod that we care about the environment and we care about climate because we talk about it. It doesn't mean that the work we do is sustainable. And I think that's a really hard reality for all of us to face and for our industry to start changing the, the, the tone on. I think that sustainable means the buildings, you know, true, the true word of sustainability means the buildings are actually able to, to exist in harmony with nature, to exist for, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years, to be built of materials that don't harm uh, the planet in any way, including animals, uh, the ecological systems. Um, to get there, we're we are so far from there, unless we're digging holes in the ground and covering them with twigs, we are so far from really building sustainably. And so it is dangerous for us to use this word that is not transparent, it is not transparent. But what we are all trying to do is become more sustainable. We are all trying to get better. There is no beacon, you know, lead platinum, whatever sort of seal of approval that we get to try to convince ourselves that we've done it. We haven't. And I am, and our practice is as much a part of this problem as any other. We have a long way to go to really be sustainable. I always think about, um, you know, sort of um, evolution and the idea that, that Darwin taught us that all flora and fauna on the planet are are designed by mother nature to thrive, uh, to do, to use the lowest energy possible to thrive and, and propagate. And it all that's true of all flora and fauna to survive um, and propagate. And again, use the lowest energy possible. And I think that's true for all species on the planet, except for ours. We seem to use the most energy possible to guarantee that we will not survive and propagate. And the way that changes is for us to think about in our work that question. There basically are no sustainable buildings. Now there are exceptions and there are 
unbelievably talented, motivated people trying really hard to do better in this. And I don't mean to disparage any of us all trying with the best of intentions, but I do think it's top, it's time to stop calling buildings sustainable. Um, I think it's time to recognize that we are on a path towards sustainable, but we are not sustainable yet. And there are no sustainable buildings. So for each of you, what I challenge you to think about is what your purpose is. For me, as I sort of plot along what, what things personally and then what things are, as a firm are we interested in? And I started to, to look at specific issues. It is impossible for us to all tackle all of these kinds of issues all of the time. But instead, it's a chance for us to think about the things that do motivate us. So none of us can be all those things. No firm can excel at it at all. But we are an industry that deeply cares about each other, about community, about planet, society, economy, and culture. We are an industry that is very, I think, very beautiful and very noble. Um, my, my friend Andrew Waugh, a great architect from the UK, talks about how we're, architects are um, Jedi, Jedi warriors, Jedi, Jedi knights. And it's that idea that we are sort of the last of our generation of, of protectors. And I, I don't know that that's true, but I do know that there is nobility in what we all are trying to do because there's deep love in the work that I know all of you do. Um, and the reminder that it's not just our actions, it's the weight of the global issues and community issues above and the, the desire for our, our profession to be seen in a different light is incredibly important. So if happiness is built on those three ingredients and purpose is a, a key one, finding, celebrate, sharing, and cultivating your purpose as a practice and as an individual will change your direction. So for us, this has been true at MGA. We feel incredibly lucky. We're in our 10th year. It's a huge honor, as I said, to be, to be noted by the architecture, Architizer uh, A Plus Awards. And, it, and, and this is what happened. We set out with this purpose to build the mass timber, to focus on climate. And all of a sudden it brought values aligned clients to us. It brought clarity to our mission. It differentiated us from our peers. It attracted like-minded collaborators that solved some real problems of which we have a long way to go. And it helps bring us and our team happiness. And I believe all these things can be true for all practices, but to do this, it makes sense to write down your purpose weekly to stay true to your purpose, to remind yourself that it's not just about paying the bills and all of the challenge it takes to, to, to do the work we all do, the difficult clients and the complicated regulatory process and the um, you know budgets that can't quite make it there. All of those things can be overcome by a sense that we have a purpose, we can make a difference, that our profession is beautiful and that we can do far, far more together than apart. Um, and so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there, Paul. And I, I could show some, you know, the next few slides are a bunch of pictures of the work we do, and I might just click through those really briefly while we're while we're talking. But I I, I didn't want to talk about buildings today. I wanted to talk about you know the love of what we do and the why. And so. Um, what I'm looking forward to in this audience is the amazing stories of why and the purpose that you each have, um, because I have no doubt that um, that you all have incredible stories to tell for yourself. Um, so, Paul, what do you think? Should we do some questions now, and I'll I'll just kind of click through a few images, or should I describe okay. click through and describe them quickly? Oh, that's a hard one because I I really want to see them, but <laughs> on the other hand, I also want to have this this Q&A um, because that was so fascinating. Um, thank you so much for your honesty. Um, that That's the one huge takeaway for me. Um, I think this might be the first time I've ever heard an architect say that buildings in general are not sustainable. And I think it's super refreshing <laughs> um, because, yeah, we understand what what it means to make a building more sustainable than the default, right? But that doesn't mean that it's actually sustainable in the long term. So um, I think that's that's hugely valuable. Um, and yeah, um, I think 
perhaps you can run through some of your projects just so so that for those of those of um in yeah the, like, less I, than me, that would yeah be yeah so so let me just touch really quickly on a few and and um you, you know to your, to your point about the sort of transparency of saying buildings are not sustainable i think um you know like i said that's what patagonia did in their in their catalog and took the world by storm as a result um for for those i didn't finish that story but for some of you you may have seen last week uh, the announcement that Yvon chenard this guy that's been a hero of mine since i was 10 gave away patagonia to um to uh, gave away the 300 billion dollar company he gave it to a trust and a not-for-profit such that all of the pro proceeds from patagonia going forward will go to climate change 100 million dollars a year will go to address climate change um that's that's leadership that's that's you know that's the, the ability to work outside of the conventions of normal business and i think as architects and practitioners we we have that same opportunity to think very differently than others um i'll show you some projects just to kind of give you a lens into the kind of things we do this is actually uh ronald mcdonald house at vancouver children's hospital and and uh it houses 73 families of kids with would uh, mostly the cancer to be able to be close to the hospital while their child gets looked after. And, and this is the first CLT, major CLT building built, uh, cross a timber building built in North America. Um, and it's it's a incredibly, it's a good building to start because when I say that for us and for me personally, buildings are about love, this building could not be more, a, a better example of a building built for love. Um, I became so you know, this is a building when we talked to the contractors while we were building it, people would be in tears um, because we understood the meaning um, for these families going through this horrible, horrible moment in their lives um, with the ch sick child. Um, and this is a building I wrote a children's book for just because I couldn't, um, you know, I, I became so vested in, in not just making the building, but the story of why. Um, so this is the same building. And this is the same building for Ron McDonald House. Oops. Um, That's probably what we're more known for. This is um, the first Hollywood building in North America and the second in the world. It's a 100% timber building, the Wood Innovation Design Center. Um, um, some projects we're working on now, this one's just starting construction in Paris. It's an all mass timber building in Paris, um, mixed, mixed use building in Paris that we're pretty excited about. Uh, this is a campus in in California for an undisclosed client, but it's it's something we're really excited about as well. It's it's a lot of um, uh, major work collaborative space around um, industrial space. And um, uh, this is an older project. This is City Hall in North Vancouver. Um, all of these projects sort of somehow were built with some level of innovation. This is actually a really fun high school uh, innovation center project on Vancouver Island for Shaun Shaughnessy, which is a private school. Um, they actually have drone and robot wars inside this space, which is maybe the most both scary and unsustainable and super cool thing you can do in a space. <laughs> um, so we're working on that right now. Um, this is a, just a, a, a more coarse building at, uh, along the waterfront in Vancouver. It's a place to service boats. We're doing a grocery store right now, um, trying to redefine, and this is something I've really wanted to do for a long time, of really look at strip malls and try to look at whether the economics of the strip mall could change. I'm really passionate about the idea that as architects, far too many buildings that we use every day are not really the buildings architects want to work on, and yet they're the ones we, we visit every single day. And so, um, you know, wherever we can do um, you know, use our design language to, to help those spaces and make them, you know, greater community places is something we're interested in. Um, and actually, I think this is the last project. This is a project that's not funded yet, but it's a super important project to me on a personal level. This is way up on Baffin Island, which is the island in Canada next to Greenland. It's a very remote location. It's at a, what's called an Inuktitut language center. So Inuktitut is the language of the Inuit people. Um, sometimes historically called Eskimo in America. Um, and this is the only language center and university in the world. And so the hope is to build, to complete this project as um, in this very remote region. Um, 
but it's it's a pretty special project as we we try to do a fair bit with uh, we're increasingly doing more work with indigenous communities now in Canada, which is something that's part of our purpose as well. Um, you know, whereas climate's the big one, I think at a community level, we're super fascinated by affordability and indigenous community issues and reconciliation, which is a big part of the Canadian conversation today with our indigenous peoples. So uh, that's a little snapshot and maybe, uh, maybe with that, Paul, we do some questions. This is the first time I'm seeing that that project, so I'm super excited about that one. Um, I can't wait to see to see more. Um, yeah, so just before I jump into questions, whilst I'm whilst I'm thinking of it, um, we have a poll open right now. Um, if you navigate to the bottom right and you click on the polls tab, um, if you're interested in potentially following in the footsteps of Michael and our other speakers, um, and you're part of a, an architecture firm that might like to participate in the upcoming A plus awards, um, you can let us know in the poll, um, you can request a submission guide um, and you can request to be added to uh, to our newsletter for um, for submission tips and deadline reminders and things like that um, once the, once the uh, program gets going. Um, so we're gonna leave that open. Um, and now we'll jump to some questions. Um, and this is gonna be a challenge because there are a lot. <laughs> so I'm gonna just see what rises to the top here. Um, so Peter Tomanek has um, a great opening question, which is, uh, in your opinion, does the government incentivize green building adequately? Um, has it been difficult to steer a construction industry embedded in convention in a new direction? That's sort of, I guess, a, a, a two-part yeah, question. Yeah, and that is an excellent question. So, <laughs> so it depends which government, obviously. The, the, the cool thing when you guys came online as I was watching where people live and people were in Ethiopia and, and Canada where I am, but all over the world. And that, that's kind of what's wonderful about this forum and my architecture. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, I think that, I mean, I'm sure many of you share the same, climate change is existential for humanity and it is, um, far, far, far overdue that we have dramatic change in, in government policy um, and incentives, both around the building industry and every other industry. And it's not a simple formula, right? So I'm a huge proponent. I actually have a little uh, company doing conversions of electric cars. I take old Land Rovers and make them electric. But electric cars have this new huge problem of where do we get the battery technology, uh, the battery uh, metals, right? The mining impact of that. Um, so nothing is a simple answer is our biggest challenge. And I think government tends to need to look at things in these kind of big chunks. Let's convert the car industry. Let's convert, you know, the energy expectations of buildings. I think at the end of the day, our, in, our industry and our voices have to matter more than government. We have to do we have to be the convincing ones and we have to find better voice to leverage government policy. So there's a stat I often uh, quote in the United States, the US government spends 0.0001% of all innovation money on the building sciences. So we're an industry that holds almost half of global uh, of greenhouse emissions from the United States in the United States. And yet we get 0.0001% of the innovation dollars. That's because we do not, we are not um, championing what we do in a, in a vocal way with the public in general, and certainly with government. People don't know what we do. And that's kind of part of what I was speaking to, right? That's part of why our associations matter and also why all of us, and especially the big design voices in the world that have you know the most sort of forum to be able to talk, should put for to me put first and foremost this idea of advocating for our industry advocating for policy changes that will matter um and and pushing um you know for resources for for uh, for in, innovation investment as well as for resources for building sciences so um so that's that per the first the first part i've already forgotten the second part of the question um it was more about the um the construction industry itself so um, oh, has, it, has it is it difficult to steer to steer the industry which is so embedded in convention um yeah in a new direction yeah. that's right so um i always tell the story that you know about 15 years ago is when i wrote the 
first book on tallwood buildings and people thought i was an absolute idiot <laughs> they were like this guy there is no way this is ever going to happen and this industry is so pointed in one direction this is never going to happen um but it happened and why did it happen well it was a lot of convergence of a lot of people that cared from all over the world voices that were willing to speak up from all over the world um and i'll i'll add in the in the interest of transparency it's not enough it's not it's not it's a solution for now it's not a good solution for the long term mass timber is not going to solve the world's problems and 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 so we have to keep pushing innovation our industry can change there is an enormous amount of money um in our that drives our industry um arguably the one one of the biggest industries on the planet and yet um, most of the big investors still think they can make all their money in technology when in reality they can make all their money in building science and innovation. And that's the other piece that I'm really keen to see is a change in the conversation of where we access money for not just from government, but from industry. So there's a, you know, a McKinsey report that talks about how 800 billion dollars a year is spent on the car industry and 900 billion dollars a year is spent on the entire software tech industry and this is in the united states but 1.2 trillion dollars a year goes into the building industry and yet all of the innovation money is going to the tech sector and the car sector and all of the public wants to talk about is the is those two sectors and yet we are considerably bigger and so the only way that changes is we stop only talking about what we do from you know from the lens of this is you know sexy and beautiful architecture which is also important but also from the lens of look at the power and the meaning of what we're doing um, which is more important frankly today that is the mo most important conversation is what is this building going to do around the climate that is the existential question for humanity and therefore it has to be the first question for architecture always Sorry, Paul, I might screw up Architizer by saying that. <laughs> <laughs> we can change too. Uh, <laughs> super dynamic. Uh, we just tell stories. So, you know, this is the story you're telling today is, you know, it's gold for us um, because it's different. Um, and, and I think, you know, that even though it's, you're, you're asking, we were asking ourselves difficult questions. Um, it's, it's definitely good. And from a content perspective, from an editor's perspective, this is exactly what we want. So I'm happy. Um, yeah. So um, another question, and it kind of links a little bit what you said before, uh, what you were talking about earlier about education. Um, uh, Banish asks, oh, there's so many questions coming in. I'm trying to keep track. Um, Banish asks, uh, do you think education and architecture is doing enough to define and embed the whys and um, the purpose um, as an ingredient of happiness to the students for future architects, um, considering our industry has a bit of a reputation for um, kind of being martyrs to the cause. Right. I think this right. is right. Um, no, I, I, I think that there's a whole bunch of things about education that has to change. One is the very definition of what we do as leadership. We are, you know, as the architect on a project, you're taking the idea together a collaborative idea ideally and, and harnessing all these engineers contractors the owner everybody together and trying to move in one direction that notion of our role in society and our role on the project as being leaders asks us why are we not taught about leadership what does that actually look like what is what does it mean to be a leader what are the responsibilities of that um so i think that's a missing ingredient of of our profession and education. I think it's equally important that that story of why that purpose um, piece that I think each of us has as an individual story. Um, I see too many students come in with an amazing sense of desire and purpose to do good in the world and come out the other end of architecture school somehow wanting to, you know, build very, very expensive houses for very, very fancy people and, 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 you know, and win awards. And so, you know, we're, our school system is sort of diluting too much, historically has diluted too much of that sense of purpose. And it doesn't have to. Now that's changing because I think young faculty are bringing new ideas to the fore and I think that'll continue to change. But we should continue to push our schools to speak about this issue of purpose and understand our role in the world. 
I'm just going to read you a comment that just came in from Roderick because it's so nice. Um, one of the most important presentations that he's seen in years. Um, and he said it's a must for, for the profession. So um, I think that's that's a pretty great, um, oh, pretty great nice. instant feedback there. Uh, I'll ask, um, I think we have time for a couple more questions real quick. Um, let me see. Um, Andy asks a, a great question. Um, how do we help architects specify materials that demonstrate love, uh, love for the planet? Um, what's the best approach in to educate architects that don't appear to understand the climate costs of their design specification choices? So, um, yeah, <laughs> um, it's hard because, as I said, everything we do has almost everything we choose to do has an impact. And it is really deeply hard to understand that impact um, from a climate point of view or from other points of view. Um, Grace Farms um, Foundation in, in Eastern U.S. is doing an incredible program to look at uh, modern slavery in the building materials industry and understanding where our materials come from and whether it actually engages uh, human slavery in, 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 in all of its modern interpretations of what that word means. Um, so whether it's a human suffering connected to building material choice that we can't understand or, uh, you know, or a climate understanding, it is, it is difficult to understand that. Um, the best way, I think that the the only sort of offering I can give is to source local, know where things come from, and try to choose materials grown by the power of the sun. Those are those are, um, you know, I dream of a day when every building material, everything in the photo behind Paul there is, which is our Oregon State University um, project, where every non you know wood piece that you see there is actually made out of something organic. Um, aluminum is really rough on the environment. That's in the window system. How do we make that better? Um, glass, same thing. So all of that's possible. It's just going to take time. Um, and and so source local, know where it comes from as best you can, and use as few materials as you can. That's the other offering I would give. Find the best one and then use it everywhere. <laughs> um, but it's hard. It's a hard thing to do, and it's an imperfect system. How to encourage others? I think. You know, I think this is where Paul's team has it has a huge voice, right? I mean, how we celebrate what success looks like in our industry is really important. And I think it's really important to celebrate cultural impact of projects. Um, you know, the the fascinating qualities of, of, of just pure design as a design conversation. And then also this question of meaning. Um, what is that building doing to inform something that really shapes and changes society? as locally or globally. Um, uh, all of that comes through this, you know, what Architizer gives us all, which I think is a huge gift of being able to at least understand what everybody's doing and share what everybody's doing. Fantastic. And unfortunately, I think we're just just out of time to ask any more. And there are so many. <laughs> um, so um, if you are open to it, Michael, um, do you mind if I share um, the other questions with you um, via email, and maybe you can respond to it awesome. at your leisure. Um, that would be super. Um, so anybody that uh, anybody whose question I haven't asked, um, yeah, hopefully um, we'll be able to to get to you via email, um, and that would be awesome to keep the conversation going. Um, so yeah, um, the poll's still open. If you're interested in learning more about the upcoming program, um, please do um, respond to that poll. Um, we'll leave it open as we say goodbye. But thank you so much, Michael. Um, this uh, this talk was was different and unique compared to all the others we've had, and I think it you know it's such an important um, such an important story um, to be told. So um, yeah, we'll have to do it again um, again sometime soon, um, and I look forward to to seeing how those those new projects progress. Thank you. Um, listen, thanks everybody for attending. We really appreciate all your thoughts, and thanks Paul for this, and keep up the good work at Architizer. Thanks guys. Thanks so much. Yeah. Peace Cheers. out, everybody. Bye, everybody.